Good evening. I'm Patricia Van Skype, Director of the Lloyd Library and Museum in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, The Flowering Times, They Are a Changing, with Dr. Kellen Callinger Yoke. The Lloyd Library is a world renowned independent research library devoted to bringing science, art, and history to life. It was founded more than 140 years ago by three brothers who manufacture nature-based medicine and collected books and specimens about plants and nature. In addition to conducting medical research, they were avid book lovers and dedicated conservationists, a spirit that lives on today as we unite our rich historical and contemporary nature-based collections with global and local learners. Today's lecture is presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Floramania, a lively expression of botanical book illustrations. While the exhibition presents a 300 year retrospective, the flowering times are a changing, especially as a result of climate change. Tonight, we'll learn how extreme weather affects our flowering plants and how they are responding to those environmental effects. Our presenter, Dr. Kellen callinger Yoke, earned her PhD in evolution, ecology, and organismal biology at The Ohio State University, where she is now an assistant professor. Her current research spans biology and pedagogy, focusing both on developing educational equity in STEM and investigating flowering responses to global warning. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Kellen Callinger Yoke. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's so nice to be with all of you here tonight, and I'm really excited to get a chance to talk with you all about my work. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen with all of you so that we can all take a look at things together. All right, here we go. So um, thank you again so much for having me here tonight. I'm really excited to talk with you all about the work that I've done that focuses um, broadly on global warming and human changes in our environment, but in a way that's nice and specific to us right here in Ohio. So what we're going to do is take a look at some of the work that I've done, thinking about how temperatures in Ohio have increased over time, and then the impacts that's having um, on when our plants are doing some really critical things, like putting out their flowers, which is a critical method of reproduction for one major group of plants. Then we're also going to talk a little bit about how we're seeing changes in the distribution of different species throughout Ohio and finish up with a little bit of a discussion about what we can do um, given the, the pretty large scale changes that we're seeing in the way that Ohio's forest ecosystems function. So the first thing that we want to do before we dive into talking about how flowers are responding to increasing temperatures is talk a little bit about why things are happening in the first place, right? So we mentioned already that when we think about flowering times shifting, a large portion of what we're seeing today is because of global warming. And this is a particularly timely talk right now because I don't know how things are in Cincinnati, but here in Columbus, it is unseasonably warm for February and we're coming off of just generally a really warm winter. And what we want to do is talk a little bit about why that's happening, why unseasonably warm weather, particularly in the winter and spring here in Ohio, is becoming more and more common over time. So to think a little bit about what global warming is and how it functions, the first thing that we want to do is talk about the way Earth's atmosphere functions under normal circumstances in absence of any human activities adding greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So for that, we're going to think a little bit about the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is a natural process where Earth's atmosphere, so that layer of air that surrounds Earth's surface as it heads out into outer space, contains some really critical gases that we call greenhouse gases. 
Greenhouse gases are super important because what they do is they trap heat close to Earth's surface and keep Earth a pretty nice, warm, moderate temperature over historic timescales where humans have been around. So the critical greenhouse gases that we tend to think about associated with global warming are this one here, CO2, carbon dioxide, and this one over here, CH4, which is methane. Right now, the big player is CO2. So let's talk a little bit about what these greenhouse gases do under normal circumstances. So Earth's energy comes from the sun, our star. And when that solar radiation comes in from the sun and moves toward Earth's surface, what happens most of the time is that the vast majority of that incoming solar radiation bounces right off of Earth's surface and heads back out into outer space. If all that radiation escaped back into outer space, that would leave Earth very, very cold. And in absence of the greenhouse effect, that's exactly what would happen. Earth's average temperatures would be quite literally freezing, about 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius. But because we have greenhouse gases like CO2, nitrous oxide, methane, those greenhouse gases trap that re-radiated heat as it's heading back out toward outer space and keep that heat right next to Earth's surface, allowing Earth to be the nice moderate temperatures that human civilization has thrived under. So it keeps Earth a nice moderate temperature right around on average about a little over 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so very comfortable and moderate. So now what we want to do is think about how humans have changed that natural greenhouse effect in a way that's driving global warming. So a lot of human activities like industrialization involve burning fossil fuels, right? So coal, oil, and natural gas. And when coal, oil, and natural gas are burned, that releases a lot of extra greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We already know that those greenhouse gases, through very well-established and old science, frankly, are effective at trapping that re-radiated heat. So now that we've pumped up the amount of CO2 and the amount of methane, particularly CO2, into the atmosphere, when that solar radiation comes into Earth's surface and bounces right off, a lot more of it gets trapped by those greenhouse gases and re-radiated back down toward Earth's surface. So basically what humans have done with our activities that release all that CO2 in particular is that we've taken the natural greenhouse effect that's resulted in nice, moderate, consistent temperatures over time, and we basically turned it up a lot. We've turned up the thermostat of the Earth by increasing the amount of those heat-trapping gases in our atmosphere. And the record of that increase in CO2, as well as the others, but primarily CO2 since that's our big player in global warming, is really clear. So one of the things that's particularly important is to think about how atmospheric CO2 concentrations have changed over time and then what impacts that's been having on temperature. So the data set that I've got on the screen right now is a super famous one. It's called the Keeling Curve. And the reason that it's called that is because it was started by this guy right here, Dr. Charles David Keeling. Way back in 1958, Dr. Keeling decided he was going to start something that hadn't really been done by anyone before, where he was going to do an incredibly precise record of the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And Dr. Keeling measured CO2 concentrations multiple times daily with incredible precision starting back in 1958 and continued to do so for many, many years after that. Eventually, this Keeling curve got picked up by uh, many scientists working at the Mauna Loa Observatory and remains active to this day. So the Keeling curve is our, the world's longest continuous record of atmospheric CO2 concentrations and documents some really obvious changes um, showing the increased CO2 concentrations that are occurring. So let's talk a little bit about what this figure is showing to make sure that we're all on the same page with what we're looking at. So on our horizontal axis, this bottom portion of our figure, we have a timeline starting back in 1958 when Dr. Keeling started his observations, and in this case going all the way up to the early 2020s, not quite all the way to 23 and 20, or, and certainly not 24 since that data is still being finalized. So we've got a timeline on our horizontal axis, nice and straightforward. Over on our vertical axis, that gets a little more complicated. This says CO2 mole fraction in parts per million, that PPM is parts per million. 
that's the way that scientists express how concentrated CO2 is in the atmosphere. And what that parts per million means is that if you can imagine scooping up a million parts of the atmosphere, so scoop up a million parts of the air around you, parts per million is telling you this many parts of those million are CO2. So when we take a look at where CO2 concentrations were back when Dr. Keeling started his observations, if we start right here in 1958 and kind of edge over to our y-axis over there, we can see that CO2 concentrations were right around 315-ish parts per million, so just under 320 parts per million. As Dr. Keeling and the other scientists at the Mauna Loa Observatory continued making their observations, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the first things that they noticed is that that average CO2 concentration was consistently creeping up over time. And you can follow that running mean by looking at that black line. And as we move further in time, what we see is that CO2 continues quite steadily to go up until we get to the most recent point in our time series where CO2 is now at 420 parts per million. So we started at the beginning of the time series at less than 320, and in just about, oh, let's see, 60 years, we've increased to by over 100 parts per million, which is a pretty stunning rate of increase and a, quite an obvious trend. Now, some of you might be wondering what the red wiggle is. Um, that's actually another really cool thing to talk about. It involves seasonal changes in atmospheric CO2 concentrations associated with what forests are doing. And we can talk about that later if you want because it's actually really cool. But more broadly, what we're focused on here is this black line that shows us that running mean where we have that consistent increase in atmospheric CO2 quite rapidly over the past 60 years. Now, at this point, a lot of people very reasonably say, okay, I see that CO2 has clearly gone up in the past 60 years. That's inarguable looking at this data set. But Earth is really old, right? Way older than just 60 years. So how do we know that this increase in atmospheric CO2 isn't just a part of broader natural variation in atmospheric CO2 concentrations? And that's a really good question. So for that, we have to look a little bit deeper back in time. So one of the things that's really important for us to do is conceptualize what we're seeing in that modern slice of time with that Keeling curve and think about how it fits into what Earth has been doing over much longer time scales. This figure that we're looking at now shows basically the same sort of information as the Keeling curve, except stretched out to almost a million years. So when we look at this figure documenting long-term atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations, our vertical axis is the same, right? We've got our carbon dioxide concentration in parts per million. So how many parts out of every million parts of the atmosphere are made up of carbon dioxide? Except instead of only going back to 1958, this record extends back 800,000 years. Now, there are two different sources of data for this record. When we look at the dashed line up here, that's our modern data. So that means direct observation. So direct measurements that we've been able to make with equipment that is specifically designed for measuring CO2 in the moment that it happens. All of the solid line is derived from ice core data, which you can see right there at the bottom of the figure. So basically what scientists are able to do is to go to places on Earth where it's incredibly cold all the time and drill down into glaciers that have been accumulating over hundreds of thousands of years. Trapped in those layers of ice that get laid down each year are tiny little bubbles of the atmosphere that are basically like time capsules of what the air was like at that point in time that that bubble got trapped in that layer of ice. From that, scientists, including some really well-known ones here at OSU, um, Dr. Lonnie Thompson and Dr. Ellen Mosley Thompson, can use specialized equipment to extract that air from those bubbles and then figure out the exact concentration of CO2 at the time that that ice core was, uh, the ice layer was laid down. And from that, we get this really excellent record of long-term CO2 concentrations starting 800,000 years ago, so right here, all the way up to the present in the year zero. The reason time is on that kind of funky scale is because our horizontal axis in this graph is in years before present. So zero years before present means now, and 800,000 years before present is just under a million years ago. 
So when we take a look at how our modern record of atmospheric CO2 compares to our historic one, what we can see is that we're well beyond anything Earth experienced for the past 800,000 years. In that 800,000 year time series, if we follow along this CO2 line, you can see that CO2 concentrations do vary naturally. Sometimes they go up and Earth experiences a period of um, relative warmth. Sometimes they go down and Earth is in an ice age. But when we look at that magnitude of change from the high points to the low points, what we can say is prior to the Industrial Revolution, so over here in our modern range, the very highest atmospheric CO2 concentration that Earth has experienced in the past 800,000 years was 300 parts per million. Typically, CO2 is sitting right in the mid uh, 200 to 250 range, so right around 230, with lows around 175, but like we said, the very highest in the past 800,000 years of 300 parts per million. Now we're sitting right around 420. So yes, Dr. Keeling's time series of CO2 concentration changes is a very brief slice in time, but even when we put it in a much broader context, it becomes quite clear that the CO2 concentrations that we're experiencing now are really anomalous relative to anything that happened prior to human impacts on the atmosphere. And again, this is another really cool situation for why CO2 concentrations increase and decrease naturally, which we can also talk about at the end if you'd like to. Okay, so now that we've thought a little bit about what CO2 does in the atmosphere, how it's a heat trapping gas, we've thought about how CO2 has increased on recent timescales as well as much broader timescales, the next thing that we want to do is take a look at what that means for warming so that we can think about just how much temperatures have changed since the onset of really um, rapid industrialization, so that uptick in the burning of fossil fuels. So what this figure is showing us is global average temperature across both land surfaces and ocean temperature uh, surfaces averaged across the entire year. So this is, if we look at all of Earth's surface across the whole year, here's our average temperatures. The only somewhat challenging thing about this presentation that's actually a strength of it that we'll talk about here in a second is that rather than plotting out the straight temperature of Earth on average, temperature is instead plotted out as what we call an anomaly. When temperatures are plotted out as anomaly, the way that that works is that scientists calculate a long-term average using a big chunk of the data, often all of the data. Then when scientists compare that long-term average to each year, they determine whether or not each individual year was warmer or cooler than the long-term average. Anytime a year is negative relative to this zero line that represents the long-term average, that means that year was cooler than average. So for example, if we take a look at, oh, let's say this year right here, back in the 1880s, it's sitting at just under minus 0.2 uh, degrees Celsius. So that means that year was just under 0.2 degrees Celsius cooler than the long-term average. Now, if you're more comfortable with Fahrenheit, which I'm guessing a lot of us are, we have that same scale, but expressed in Fahrenheit over here. So that year that I just talked about in the 1880s, it would be just under 0.36 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than that long-term average. So remember, this zero line is our long-term average. Any year that's above that long-term average expressed as zero is a positive temperature anomaly. That means that year was that many degrees warmer than the long-term average. So if we go over here um, and look at this year at the very end of our time series, so 2021, what we can see is that on average across the whole globe, 2021 was just under 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than that um, long-term average. Now, the reason that I really like temperature figures expressed as temperature anomalies is because it makes it really clear to see which years were warmer than average, which years were cooler than average, and just how much warmer or cooler they were. Now, the really nice thing about this figure is that not only do we have those temperatures um, across 1880, so moving back about 140 years ago, all the way up till 2021, not only are they expressed as those nice, clear anomalies, but they're also color coded. So any year that was cooler than that long term average is in blue, whereas all the hotter than average years are coded in red. 
Now, at this point, looking at that time series, the trend becomes incredibly clear. When we look at where those cooler than average years are concentrated, they're at the beginning of our time series. So from 1880, moving on up into just about the 1940s. From 1940 to around 1980, we get a little bit of wiggle back and forth around that long-term average. But starting in 1980, we have never had a year cooler than the long-term average. So for the past over 40 years, Earth has been hotter than the long-term average every single year. And beyond that pretty, pretty stark trend there with Earth constantly being above the long-term average for the past 40 odd years at this point, the other thing that's really important to note is that that trend is ticking ever upward. So Earth isn't consistently of the same warm temperature. Earth is getting hotter and hotter on average over time. And again, this makes really good sense relative to what we saw with CO2. We have known that CO2 is a heat trapping gas for about 150 years, right? That's old science. So it makes really basic sense that if you increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere dramatically, then you've got way more gas trapping heat and Earth is going to heat up over time, which is exactly what we've seen. So what we want to do now then is kind of bring it closer to home, right? Because we've looked at broad global averages, but what about right here in Ohio where all of us are? Well, it turns out that the pattern um, associated with global warming, unsurprisingly, is reflected right here in our own state. So this figure, just like the ones that we've been looking at, is showing us temperature change, this time in degrees Fahrenheit, because this was produced by um, a U.S. governmental body, and we use Fahrenheit still. Um, so what it shows us is temperature change in degrees Fahrenheit relative to the average temperature from 1900 to 1960. So in this case, this black line at zero is showing us the average temperature in Ohio from that time. And again, any year that's um, higher than that zero line means that was a warmer than average year. Any year that's lower than that zero line means that that's a cooler than average year. Just like what we saw with that global trend, when we look at where the bulk of those cooler than average years happen, they're happening in the earlier portion of our time series. By the time we get out to just before the 2000s, so in the 1990s, around 35-ish years ago at this point, much like with that global trend, pretty much every year after that is warmer than the long-term average. There are only two exceptions to that rule where we have one barely dipping down below that long-term average and another over here um, in the 2010s. But other than that, every single year is above that long-term average. On average, across the entire state of Ohio, temperatures have increased by about a degree and a half Fahrenheit over the past 120 years, with areas of locally greater warming, particularly in the northern portions of the state. So the northeast and northwest have warmed at a markedly faster pace than the southern portions of the state. Now, where we go from here in Ohio is largely a product of human decision making, right? Human decision making and industrialization is what got us into the situation where we have elevated CO2 and elevated temperatures. So what we should anticipate moving forward is entirely based on what people choose to do in terms of our emissions profiles. If we choose to continue emitting high amounts of CO2 and methane into the air, then the scenario that we're looking at moving out 80-ish years from now by the time we get to 2100 is a much warmer average. So if we eyeball this higher emission scenario where it could be anywhere in this bracket from the lowest possible estimate up to the highest estimate, we can kind of look right in the middle and scroll over to that axis where we look at temperature change. In the high emission scenario, we're looking at Ohio on average being right around 11 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was at the start of the century. Now, if we make different decisions and pick a lower emissions pathway where we choose to radically reduce the amount of um, fossil fuels that we're burning and the amount of greenhouse gases that we're emitting, things are quite a bit more moderate. Right now, we're still locked into warming because CO2 remains in the atmosphere for varied amounts of time, but typically around 50 to 125 years. So all the CO2 that we've put out already is going to stay in the atmosphere for a relatively long period. So we're committed to that warming already. 
But if we choose to emit less CO2, you see that we get into this much more lower emissions pathway, where if we kind of eyeball where my cursor's going over to the left-hand side, we're looking at temperature change of way less, around about six degrees Fahrenheit higher at the end of the century, which is a much more moderate and tenable situation than our higher emission scenario. So what we've seen so far, CO2 concentrations are going up and CO2 is a, a warming gas, right? It traps and re-radiates heat. That increased CO2 concentration is reflected in global patterns of temperature increase that we've observed, as well as right here in Ohio. So what we want to talk about now is what that means for Ohio's plants, for our forests and the way that they function. Now, there are a bunch of different ways that we can evaluate the impacts of global warming on the way that our forests function, but the way that I specialize in, in particular is through studying something called phenology. Phenology is a really broad field that involves the timing of key life events in any organism. When we think about phenology, this encompasses things like when birds migrate north in our springs, when they migrate south in our autumns, when animals enter and exit hibernation, and for plants, really critical things like we're going to be seeing here in the next few weeks and months, the time that plants unfold their leaves and the times that they put out their flowers. Now, when we think about phenology, typically phenological events are really sensitive to temperatures. And that actually makes really good sense because timing these key life events like mating and hibernation and migration are critical for survival and reproduction of organisms. If we think about something like migration time, let's say that a bird migrates to the north too soon in the spring, that's really bad news for that bird because if it goes up to its summer grounds up north before there's a readily available food source for it, so before its food source has grown or emerged, then that bird faces starvation. So timing that migration is incredibly critical. And the same is true for when we think about plant phenology events. Timing the emergence of leaves to maximize the amount of photosynthesis that plant can do over the course of the growing season is a major benefit to that plant's ability to acquire energy. But also making sure that those leaves don't come out too early and get killed by a frost is equally important. Same thing with when we think about flowering phenology. In a group of plants called angiosperms, those are our flowering plants, Flowers are the way that they engage in sexual reproduction, and re um, engaging in optimal reproduction is really critical when we think about populations being maintained in areas over time. If plants come, or if flowers flower too early and come out before their pollinators, then they're not going to be able to reproduce. If plants come out too late and are mismatched with their pollinators, or if they come out too early and are mismatched with their pollinators, that's going to negatively impact their reproduction. If they come out at the wrong time and a seasonal frost kills those flowers, that's lost reproduction. So it makes sense that plants and other organisms very commonly use temperature as the critical cue in timing those really important life events that are critical for survival and reproduction. Now, unsurprisingly, given that these phenological events are highly responsive to temperature, one of the things that we're seeing globally with climate warming is that we're seeing pronounced shifts in the timing of these phenological events. As Earth heats up, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly in the winter and springtime, we're seeing these dramatic shifts in the timing that organisms are doing their typical life events. There are some really cool ways that we can capture the way that these shifts are happening. One really neat way that scientists have been thinking about how to evaluate flowering phenology is by accessing historical data sets and historical pictures, for example. The pictures that I've got here are taken from a study that was conducted up at the Arnold Arboretum in Massachusetts associated with Harvard, where they've got this really nice, um, rich historical record of pictures taken on the site. And so what a group of scientists did was go back and look at pictures of identifiable species growing at the Arnold Arboretum that had associated dates. Then they went out to, in that same area at the Arnold Arboretum and took pictures of those paired um, events in modern time series. And the results that they got when looking across time were really quite incredible. So if we look at this first picture, it shows a flowering bush in, on June 20th, back in 1926. 
When we look at that same event in the same species at the same property in 2003, so just under 80 years later, we can see that that bush is in full flowering over a month earlier, about a month and a half earlier than it was 80 years earlier. Same thing when we look at this really beautiful lady slipper orchid. Back in 1917, the year my grandma was born actually, this lady slipper orchid was in full flowering on June 22nd. When we fast forward to 2005, again, we're about a full month earlier. And similarly, we can also look at um, differences um, when maintaining the same date across time. So this is a really interesting example of a picture taken at a cemetery up in Massachusetts, where on May 30th in 1868, so quite a long while ago, you can see that those trees are completely bare. No leaves are evident in that picture. Fast forward to 2005, so about 130 years later, and on that exact same date, May 30th, we've got those trees more or less fully leafed out. So we're seeing these really profound differences in when plants are doing these critical events that are important for their ability to survive and reproduce. Now, like we said, a very common observation when we think about how global warming is impacting our forests is that particularly when we think about um, winter and spring, it's heating up a lot earlier. So we've got this shift in our spring and early summer seasons to starting quite a bit earlier on average, much like we're seeing outside right now with February being so unseasonably warm and much of the winter being unseasonably warm. We also know that while plants and lots of other organisms use temperature as this um, cue for when they do their critical life events, not all plants shift their phenology in the same way. So specifically, we're going to be talking about flowering phenology, the time that these flowering plants put out their flowers for reproduction. When we see increasing temperatures and earlier timing of seasons, some plants like horsefly weed, a, a plant that we have right here in Ohio, all of them will be that we have right here in Ohio, exhibit what we would call a really strong flowering shift. So when temperatures go up, flowering scoots forward really, really rapidly. So flowering would occur much earlier in the season as temperatures increase. Other species are quite a bit more moderate in their responses. So when temperature goes up, May apple, one of my favorite spring ephemerals, shows a pretty moderate shift. So it advances flowering a bit as temperatures increase more quickly, but not by nearly as much as horsefly weed. Other plants like Pride of Ohio up here at the top don't show any shift in the timing of their flowering at all with elevated temperatures. So while we know that on average, flowering time changes with increased temperatures, we also know that there's a lot of variation from species to species. Now, one thing that gets scientists like me particularly interested when we think about this species-specific variation is that when we look at all of these divergent responses to warming, it's pretty unlikely that all of those different responses to elevated temperatures are going to be equally successful as our world continues to warm more. So the concern that this raises for us is that if some species have flowering responses to temperature that are advantageous, but others don't, who are going to be the winners and who are going to be the losers? And what does that mean for biodiversity moving forward? Well, that's exactly what I tried to figure out, specifically right here in Ohio. But it turns out there's actually a lot of challenge associated with that. Because when we think about studying changes in flowering time associated with global warming, most of the time those studies rely on historic observational data sets that span long periods of time and ranges of temperature. But those are really rare because most of the time 100 years ago, people weren't walking around recording extensive information about the timing of flowering. So that means that these are incredibly rare, cover very limited areas, and leave the vast majority of the global land surface completely unstudiable. Similarly, setting up a brand new modern observational study is challenging because one, it costs a bunch of money, and two, from the time that you start, you need to have a lot of years of data before you can start establishing trends. 
So this leaves us with a really big problem because it means that we can't study most of Earth's land surface or most of Earth's species to figure out how global warming might be shifting the timing of their flowering. So clearly this, this calls for alternative methods to allow us to look into these really um, important changes in areas that are currently completely understudied. This is where museums and libraries come in as incredibly critical depositories of historic information. While historic observational data sets are incredibly rare, historic specimens are not rare at all. When we think about museum specimens, museums globally hold about 1.5 billion preserved specimens. Read that as 1.5 billion data points covering the global land surface. And that is an incredible wealth of information because on those museum specimens, specifically the um, flowering plants that I was interested in, we basically have this wonderful time capsule into exactly what this organism was doing in the moment that it was collected. So we can see exactly when that plant was flowering, when it was collected, and then use that information to figure out how different species might be shifting their flowering. So what I did was take advantage of Ohio State, my home university, Ohio State's really incredible herbarium associated with our Museum of Biological Diversity. At the Ohio State Museum of Biological Diversity alone, we have over half a million pressed preserved plant specimens. So what this let me do was go into OSU's herbarium that spans hundreds of years of collections all across the state of Ohio and all of our counties and look at a huge number of flowering plants that grow right here in Ohio. When I evaluated each one of those plant specimens for my first study for a total of 141 species, what I did was assess every individual specimen to make sure that it was in the appropriate phenological phase. The phenological phase that I used was what I called maximum flowering, where basically to be included in my study, I said that each specimen had to have at least 50% of its flowers open, so reproductively available, able to reproduce. And on this little one here, it's one of my favorites, Dicentra cucularia or um, Dutchman's breeches, you can see all of these flowers that are open and available for reproduction. So this plant would be included in my analysis. So at this point I can say, okay, I know this individual is flowering because I'm literally looking at its flowers. The other critical thing that these museum specimens have for you is specific information on exactly when and where that specimen was collected. So at this point, not only do I know that this plant was flowering, I also know exactly where it was when it was flowering, the exact date that it was flowering and the year it was collected. So what that lets me do is pair every single individual plant specimen with a temperature specific to the location it was growing, the date it was growing, and the year that it was collected. And to do that, I dipped into another incredibly rich source of data called the U.S. Historical Climatology Network that has thousands and thousands of weather stations across the contiguous United States that have been continuously collecting temperature data since 1895. In Ohio, all of our U.S. Historical Climatology Network sites are documented by these red stars. So you can see we've got a pretty robust historical climatology network located right here in Ohio. So what I did was take NOAA's climate divisions for Ohio that I've indicated here with black lines and numbered 1 through 10, and I calculated monthly and yearly averages for every single one of those climate divisions temperatures. That way, if let's say I collect or I had a specimen that was collected in your home county, Hamilton County, I could say, okay, if that plant was flowering in Hamilton County in 18, oh, let's say 1898 in April, I could pair that specific plant with the temperature for its climate division, its season of flowering, and the year that it was flowering. And from there, what that let me do for every single species in my study was figure out just how much their flowering time shifted as temperatures increase. So I want to give you just a quick idea of the way that I did that using another one of my favorite species, this little lady slipper orchid here called a moccasin flower that I think is just really beautiful. 
So what I did for every single specimen was figure out what was called the flowering day of year. So I converted that calendar day to a numeric day of year where one is January 1st and December 31st is day 365. So I converted those to a numeric value that was associated with that tag on every single specimen. Then I paired each specimen with the temperature for its location, date, and year of flowering. Each one of the individual points on this figure represents one specimen of this lady slipper orchid that was um, collected somewhere in Ohio. I've added in some dates here to help give you an idea of what these flowering day of years look like. But when I plotted out these points, the day of year, versus temperature, what I could do is run a trend line through that scatter of points to see how the day of year changed as temperatures increased. For this specific um, species, this moccasin flower, what I found is that as temperatures go up, so toward the right-hand side of my figure, the day of year of flowering goes down. Flowering happens earlier as temperatures increase. Specifically, the way that flowering increases for this species is that for every degree Celsius that, uh, that temperatures increase, lady slipper orchid will flower 3.4 days earlier. And we can see that where in our very coolest records, this flower was flowering on June 9th. But if we move toward the um, right hand side of our graph here, in the very warmest years, flowering was advanced quite a bit to the very end of April. So we've got this big range of about a month and a little bit, a month and just over a week, based on temperature that lets us figure out exactly how much flowering will change as temperatures increased. So the, for the first study that I did, I assessed flowering shifts for 141 species growing in the state of Ohio. And what I found is that 46% of them had significantly increased temper or increased, uh, excuse me, advanced flowering times with increased temperatures. Out of those 141 that I assessed in my first study, we got those 46% who showed significantly earlier flowering as temperatures increase, while only two of them showed delays in flowering um, with increased temperatures. So the obvious trend is that for those species that do respond to temperatures, which is just about half of them, they're shifting to earlier timing as temperatures warm. But one of the other things that I looked at was whether or not those um, patterns for flowering advancement were consistent across different groups. And what I found is that there were some very clear patterns. Depending on the season in which a given species flowers, on average, they showed much stronger or weaker responses. So for example, those species that put out their flowers in the spring, so in April and May, like this pretty flower here, Cardamine angustata, they were the most responsive. They showed the strongest advancement of flowering with increased temperatures for an average of about 2.5 days earlier for every degree Celsius that temperature went up. When we get into the early summer flowering species like June and July, we get a much more moderate response, only about a day and a half. And by the time we get into our late summer flowers, so those in August and a little bit later, we don't really see much temperature response at all. There was no significant shift for that group at all. So we see this really stark difference based on season of flowering. So for you all, if you like going out and trying to find um, early spring flowers in this particularly warm year, you might want to go out a little bit earlier than you typically would because a lot of those favorite spring ephemerals are probably going to be coming out earlier than usual, assuming that temperature temperatures continue the way that they are. Now, the other thing that I was interested in from a conservation standpoint was trying to understand whether or not changes in flowering time with warming could potentially have impacts on biodiversity. So another thing that I looked at was whether or not there was a difference in the way native species were shifting their flowering time with warming as opposed to non-native species. And when I compared all of the native species that I looked at to all of the non-native species that I looked at, I found that non-native species were about twice as responsive to temperature on average as natives. So while some native species did show pronounced um, 
advancement of flowering with increasing temperatures. Those species that are not native to Ohio, some of which pose significant invasion threats, are showing much more pronounced um, advancement of flowering as temperatures go up. And as a matter of fact, when I looked at all 141 species in my data set, what I found is that the three species that shifted their flowering earlier, the very most with warming, so the ones who have the biggest response to increased temperatures, were all non-native species. So the one that had the biggest response to increased temperature was this one right here, Jimson weed, which is pretty darn common. For every degree Celsius temperature increase, which is about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, Jimson weed is advancing flowering by almost two weeks. So with only 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, aka a degree Celsius, we're looking at a two-week shift in when this plant puts out its flowers. Another one, musk thistle, is similarly highly responsive, shifting about 12 and a half days earlier for every 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit or degree Celsius. The third most responsive species was another super common one that we all probably have in our yards, red clover, that showed earlier flowering of about a week on average for every degree Celsius temperature increase. So this shows us that potentially there's a link between non-native species, the invasion of these non-native species, and their ability to respond to elevated temperatures by shifting their flowering time. Now that got me really interested in kind of asking that next question, right? Because if we see this pretty pronounced difference in how native species are responding to warming versus non-native species, what's that doing in terms of how well those species are performing here in Ohio? Are we losing them? Are we getting more non-natives? How are they changing in where they are in Ohio? So that's the next thing that I wanted to look at in my second study is could I use those same data sets gathered from these museum specimens to figure out whether or not these species are gaining ground in Ohio and expanding their distribution or if they're losing distribution in Ohio. So the way that I did that was by dividing up my time series from those museum specimens into two different chunks, a historic period that ran from 1895 up to 1970, and a modern period that started in 1971 and ran to the end of the study in 2009. And then what I did for every single species, like this really pretty one right here, Scarlet Paintbrush, was I plotted on the state of Ohio everywhere that that plant had been collected in the historic period versus the modern period. So for example, for scarlet paintbrush, you can see all these black circles represent county occurrences of that species in that historic period, so 1970 and earlier. The open circles, which are exclusively down in these two southern counties here, represent the only modern occurrences. So my question was, if I compare where it was historically versus modern, what is that percent shift? Now, obviously, one really important thing to do here, since my historic period is way bigger than my modern period, is to control for sampling effort, right? Because you would expect if you looked across a, what, 75-year period, that you would find this each species in more places than if you only look across about 40 years. So I did something called a rarefaction analysis, where basically it lets me calculate an infinite number of times the expected number of counties that these um, species would be found in between the historic period and the modern modern period while controlling for sampling effort between those two distinct periods. And what that let me do was calculate out what I called distribution shifts. And that was just the percent change in how many counties each species was found in in Ohio. So when I did that, this time for a larger number of species, I got up to 207 species this time, all of which were found right here in Ohio. What I found is that the majority of the species that I studied had had a reduced species distribution in Ohio between those two time periods. So when we look at this figure, our horizontal axis shows us that distribution shift. Everywhere on the left-hand side represents a species who's now found in fewer counties in Ohio than it was before. Everywhere on this side of our graph shows species that are found in more counties in Ohio than they were before. All the filled circles represent individual species with significant distribution loss in Ohio. Of those 207, 136 of them have significant reductions in their distribution in Ohio. 
only 12 species out of those 207 showed expansion of distribution. So the trend is very clearly that we're losing ground for where most of these species are found. Now, like I said, one of the things that I was interested in is seeing if I could figure out why some species were increasing or decreasing in distribution, and if it had anything to do with their flowering responsiveness. Now, when I looked at that for native species, the ones that showed a much more moderate response to temperature compared to our non-natives, I found no relationship between how pro pronounced their flowering shift was with temperature and how well or poorly they were doing. So they don't seem to be getting any benefit from earlier flowering or later flowering. But when I looked at the exact same question for our non-native species, I found those species that advanced flowering the most with higher temperatures were also doing better. So when I took a look at those introduced species, I plotted out only those species that are not native to Ohio. So each one of these black dots on my figure represents a species that is not native to Ohio. I've got how much they shifted flowering, where our negative values mean that they're shifting flowering a lot earlier, up to 14 days-ish per degree Celsius, versus those that aren't changing flowering at all, so no shift. Then over here, I've got the, the metric for whether they increased in distribution between those two time periods or whether they decreased. And what I found is that on average, non-native species who respond more to warming are also doing better and being found in more places in Ohio over time. Now, when we think about the extent to which this matters, it's actually quite pronounced. If we compare an invasive or a non-native species that has a flowering shift of let's say minus five to one that only has a flowering shift of minus one, we're looking at that more responsive non-native having a 10% greater range expansion than the one that responded less. So that's pretty darn pronounced. One other thing that I looked at as well, though, is whether or not all non-native species were responding in the same way. And what I found out is that those seasonal differences that we talked about earlier are also critical in this way. So when we look at some of our non-native species, particularly those that flower in June and July, so our early summer months, that response is most pronounced, where we see those most responsive individ or most responsive species showing really substantial increases in their distribution throughout Ohio that is non-randomly associated with their flowering response. So this suggests that while variation in responsiveness doesn't seem to be doing anything for native species on average, no matter what season we look at, there does seem to be a substantial benefit for our non-native species for those that are responding the very most to warming. So what does this mean for us? One, we can see that climate warming is happening here in Ohio, and it's changing the timing of seasons. And beyond that, it seems to be changing the timing of our seasons in ways that are particularly beneficial for some of our non-native species that pose potential invasion risks that could further, uh, further impact our native species growing in our forest ecosystems. So one thing that we always want to talk about at the end of these discussions of how global warming is happening, why it's happening, what it's doing to our ecosystems, are some things that we can do to make sure that we're making smart decisions for protecting our natural ecosystems. A big one is making sure that we're encouraging local, state, and federal governments to adopt CO2 reducing policies. Because while reducing your own CO2 uh, footprint is important, and I strongly encourage you to do so, making sure that we have a broader consensus on steps that we can take nationally as a community, as a society, is really critical for limiting those projections that we talked about in those high emission scenario. The other thing that I would encourage all of you to do is think about what you can do in your own little piece of the world. When we think about what's impacting Ohio's native species, it's not just global warming, it's not just invasive species, it's a lot of pressure, pressures impacting them simultaneously. 
the loss of pollinators, pollution, all sorts of things impacting our native species. So one way we can help maintain robust ecosystems is by growing native, encouraging little mini ecosystems right in your own yards. So while some of the stuff that we talked about today is definitely scary and alarming, it's also important to remember, like I said before, human decision making got us to the place where temperatures are higher and human decision making can equally limit the negative impacts that we have. So I hope that leaves us on a note of hope, keeping in mind that the trends that we see give us the knowledge we need to make informed conservation decision making and informed policy decision making as well. So there is absolutely hope moving forward and we can make the best decisions possible to protect our ecosystems as well as ourselves. And with that, I would be absolutely absolutely happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you so much for your time and listening. Thank you, Kellen. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, really clearly explained too. Um, you were mentioning all of the complexities that go on um, beyond just the CO2. Mm -hmm. And Melissa has asked for a distribution study how do you control for development and habitat destruction? That's a really excellent question. And the answer is that development and habitat destruction are absolutely some of the reasons that we see that decline in distribution. So when we look at the distribution study, the distribution study wasn't um, in the data that you looked at attributing all of those distribution declines to any one uh, variable. In that case, that was basically saying out of all 207 species that we looked at, here are the broad trends. Now, the underlying reasons that for those trends from species to species are quite variable, right? So for a lot of them, it is going to be habitat destruction and development. And one of the things that I looked at that we didn't get a chance to get into in that study was if there were features of those species that were predictive of habitat decline. Among those major predictive factors for which species were doing the very worst and losing distribution, there were a couple biggies. Any species that were obligate wetland species, so those species that have to live in a wetland and cannot live anywhere else, they showed pronounced declines in distribution, and that's because Ohio has drained the vast majority of its wetlands and converted it largely to agricultural areas. So for those wetland species, the major driver of those reductions very likely is habitat loss and development of previously wetland areas into agricultural systems. Another major predictor of declines in both abundance and distribution were species that rely on what we call obligate symbioses. That just means that these are species that have to live with another species in order to survive. Now, the way that those obligate symbioses can work varies. Sometimes it's a pollinator where only one pollinator can pollinate this particular species of flower. But most commonly in the data set that I investigated, it was orchids. So like these beautiful things here, right? Orchids are often reliant on something called mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi is a type of fungus, like the name suggests, that we don't see at the surface of the soil almost at all, but that lives wrapped around a lot of plants' roots. And the plant and the fungus are in this nice mutually beneficial relationship. The plant uh, gives that fungus carbohydrates that it produces during photosynthesis, so it shunts that energy source of sugar to the fungus. The mycorrhizal fungi helps plants get phosphorus, which is typically quite limiting in environments, but is critical for plants to be able to do photosynthesis, so critical for plants to be able to live. So they're in this mutualistic relationship where they're both benefiting one another. In the case of a lot of orchids, if their mycorrhizal fungi die, the orchid dies too. Now, the really important thing about this relationship is that a lot of mycorrhizal fungi are incredibly sensitive to soil pollution, where if soils become polluted with a variety of potential chemicals, it kills the mycorrhizal fungi. And if the mycorrhizal fungi die, so do the orchids. So when we looked at that group um, that had those, those necessary, those non-optional relationships with other species, 
orchids were vastly overrepresented there because orchids are doing quite poorly. And again, part of that might be global warming, but we didn't really see a whole lot of that with the native species. So for orchids, the, the leading hypothesis is that the reason that they're doing quite poorly is one, probably because of habitat destruction, because then they tend to like undisturbed areas, but two, probably soil pollution and the loss of those mycorrhizal symbionts that we know are critical for their survival. So yeah, there's a bunch of reasons that we saw those distributions shifts. For non-native species, unfortunately, global warming seems to be giving a bump to quite a few of them. Yeah, great question. So you were talking about um, global warming giving a bump to non-native species. Is there a point where that goes the other direction? So you go for, far enough south and does do they just keep getting better and better or do they burn out? Because That's a that. really good question. And the answer is we don't entirely know yet. Yeah. So when we think about plant temperature responses or the temperature responses of any organism, just like humans have an optimal range of temperature where if it gets too hot for us, we have heat stroke, right? Because that's beyond what our body is capable of managing. So do other organisms and plants are no different than that. So one of the things that we don't have enough data on at this point for invasive species specifically is what that tipping point is and if that tipping point varies along their geographic range. Now, more broadly for thinking about plants holistically, we absolutely know that plants have ranges beyond which they are no longer going to be able to stay in areas once those areas pass a certain temperature threshold. And we're actually already seeing that. So there are some really cool studies of range shifts over the past century where we can literally plot the northward migration of plant species as more southern locations in their range become inhospitable. It's simply too hot for them. And that's predicted to happen right here in Ohio, actually. Um, if future projections hold for Ohio and we continue on the high emissions pathway, um, buckeye trees are predicted to do quite poorly here in Ohio. We would likely lose most buckeyes if we continued on a high emissions pathway and had that really high temperature. They would all go up north and be horrifyingly in Michigan, which is just antithetical to being an OSU Buckeye, right? So yeah, absolutely. Plants do have temperature maxima. We are already seeing them get exceeded at the southernmost distributions, but we're not quite sure where that tipping point is for a lot of invasives and at different portions of the range. Excellent question. And anecdotally, I see it in my own garden, a plant mm -hmm. that I look at a picture from five, 10 years ago, and it's burning out much yes. earlier in the season. Absolutely. I had the exact same thing happen in my garden last year as well. When we went through that really intense hot patch, I have a native pollinator garden in my front and backyard, which kind of the whole point of them is that you don't really have to water them. They're really friendly from a water use standpoint. And I had to water them because they were tying. It was just too hot and dry for them. Yeah, it, it was rough. And do we know why um, the non-natives are so much less responsive or why they are they're more responsive they're more, more responsive why why is that do we have any idea why that's the case yeah we've got some hypotheses so generally when we think about non-native species particularly the ones that end up becoming invasive one of the reasons that they become invasive is because they're released from a lot of the pressures that their native environment places on them. So when we think about plants growing in their native environment, all of the other things that live around them have also evolved around them, right? So they've evolved up together. So there are pathogens that can infect those plants. There are herbivores that feed on them really effectively. There's competition for the same sorts of pollinators. So they tend to be limited by the competition that's evolved with them in their native environment. But then when plants become non-native, a lot of the time what happens is that they're released from all of that competition that existed in their native habitat because the pathogens that evolved to infect them really effectively aren't there anymore because they're back in their native range. The herbivores that can feed on them really effectively, not there anymore. So they're released from all of these pressures that tend to keep them in check in their native environment that no longer exist in this non-native range that they're in. 
So one of the hypotheses for how the most invasive plants are becoming invasive is that they're incredibly flexible. So they're generalists who can wow. occupy all sorts of different environments, including lots of distinct temperature environments. And that flexibility lets them take massive advantage of increased temperatures when they happen and gives them that bump where they're probably having longer periods of photosynthesis, potentially escaping really severe temperature for those early summer one so in um, June and July when it's starting to get up into that really uncomfortable heat and drought. If you can bump your flowering way earlier and avoid that most intense hot dry period, that's going to be a massive reproductive advantage. So yeah, that flexibility, including in the way they flower, is probably a major reason that a lot of them are invaders to begin with. Well, I'm going to ask just one more question while we wait to see if there's any more from the audience. Um, my background is in history. Mm -hmm. And so I was really curious about the, very early in your presentation, the low cool numbers around the turn of this 20th century as we have industrialization picking mm -hmm. up. Why do you think those numbers were going down or is it just relative to the rest of the numbers on the chart? Um, a little bit of both. So at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, when CO2 concentrates, CO2 concentrations weren't as elevated as they are now, the typical natural forcing factors associated with climate were quite a bit stronger than they are now. So kind of like when we look back at that 800,000 year time series, right? We know that Earth's climate varies naturally. CO2 goes up and down naturally and temperature varies with it. And that is totally normal. Right now, we've increased CO2 concentration so much that we've kind of escaped those natural forcings. So really what we're seeing for the most part is just elevated temperatures because of elevated CO2. And we'll still get El Nino and La Nina years, but they tend to be exacerbated by global warming. But when we go back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when we were still much closer to those natural regimes, then you get more of that natural variation in there. So that's just a reflection of a normal period of dip where temperatures were low for a few years and then rebounded up to the typical average. And when we think kind of more broadly about where we should be right now, we should be at the end of an interglacial period. So right now, Earth under normal circumstances, if humans weren't messing around with CO2, we would be coming off of a nice warm period between ice ages and very gradually over a period of thousands and thousands and thousands of years, slipping into another ice age. Obviously, that's not happening because we've interrupted that natural process of cycles. Yeah. Well, Kellen, thank you so much. This was really fascinating. I'd also like to thank the members of the audience for joining us and invite all of you to view our other programs that are on the Lloyd Library's YouTube channel. This will be on there as well in a couple of weeks. Um, I'd also like to point out that our programs are supported in part by members of the Lloyd Library. If you're a member, thank you very much. Um, if you would like to contribute to programs like these, you can visit our website at lloydlibrary.org. Um, we hope to see you next time. Thank you so much, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you.